Very good morning to everyone. I'm Sashila, one of the IV physicians in University of Malaya. And I would thank everyone and a very good morning for joining us for this morning's episode of Breakfast at UM Health. Before we start, I have some housekeeping rules. Uh, you will all be in mute. Questions and answers, please put them in your question and answer box, not in the chat box. Uh, and uh, we will try to answer all your questions. Uh, there's also going to be CBD points, which will be put up in the uh, chat box for you to see and, and, and register. So without further ado, I just want to say today's topic is entitled Using UVC Irradiation Effectively and Safely as a Disinfectant. As you are all aware, the predominant mode of transmission of COVID-19 is via droplet, which occurs when a person is in close contact, which is within one meter, with someone who's infected when they cough, sneeze, talk, shout, sing, or even breathe heavily. Transmission may occur directly when the infected droplet comes in contact with exposed mucosa, which is your mouth and nose, or conjunctiva, which is eyes, of the exposed person. Transmission may also occur through droplet contaminated surfaces or objects in the immediate environment around the infected person. The frequency and relative importance of this type of transmission remains unclear, but it has been shown it is very likely in heavily contaminated settings, such as in households and healthcare settings. Short range airborne transmission is also a possible route of uh, transmission under specific circumstances and settings, such as AGP, when someone shouts, sings, or breathes heavily, like in a gym. Uh, and the risk of transmission is associated with the concentration of the virus one is exposed to, as well as the duration of exposure without appropriate use of PPE, such as your mask. The higher concentration and longer the duration, the higher the risk of getting the infection. That is why most of the reported outbreaks have occurred in overcrowded confined, poorly ventilated spaces where people are, for, they are there for a prolonged period of time, especially when they do not use any preventive measures such as distancing and masking and are not, are not adhered to at that time. Hence, the modalities of environment disinfection for surface as well as air has garnered interest of late with the need to reduce viral transmission during the COVID-19 pandemic. Ultraviolet C represents one of such approach. The scientific basis of its use, underlying technology, as well as its efficacy and safety will be discussed in great details today. We have two speakers with us today who are experts in this field. Our first speaker is Professor Ng Kwan Hung, who many of you probably already know and needs no introduction, but for the, for the benefit of, the, of many others here, I see 153 people here, I'm sure some of them are not from UM. Prof Ng is a medical physicist uh, from the Department of Biomedical Imaging and Faculty of Medicine. He's also a board-certified uh, medical physicist, radiation protection specialist. He's consulted for WHO, International Atomic Ag Energy Agency, and has served in the International Committee of Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. He has also uh, got the prestigious awards of, such as uh, the Merdeka Award in 2020 and the Marie Curie Award in 2018. Our next speaker is a specialist in her, in her own right. And I found her, um, you know, she's, she's been great in advising us on uh, the UVGI technology. It's Dr. Naura Matisa, who's a researcher from, uh, uh, and from the Radiation Processing Technology Division of Malaysian Nuclear Agency. She has graduated with her PhD in polymer engineering two years ago, has more than 10 years experience in electron beam and gamma de dosimeter uh, metry work. She leads multiple projects, such as the development of polymer-based radiation sensitive indicators, and currently on the development of UVGI box for disinfection with MOH and hospital for Trojaya. So, uh, just to give you a bit of uh, format, we will start the presentation with Dr. Ng's presentation entitled, What is the Nature of UV? How does it uh, affect living things or humans in our, in our setting and, and safety? That will be for about 15 minutes, followed by Dr. Naura, who will be talking on the technology of UVC, disinfection system and measurement for another 15 minutes. And then we'll have a brief summary of the systematic review of the use of UVC by Prof. Ng. And uh, please do put your questions in the chat box and we'll get back to you. So without further ado, the uh, 
I, I, I present uh, Prof Ng. Prof Ng, to you. To begin to understand this ultra-wallacy by going to the, the basic, uh, just wait for a while. Yeah. Uh, this is a illustration from the Eric Hall's book, a very famous radio biologist, Radiation and Life. Just to show us that radiation has always been with us ever since the creation of the universe. And we live in a radiation world. So to understand this UVC, we need to go back to what is radiation. We live in the radiation world and we are all been exposed to either the natural or the artificial or the man-made radiation. Now what is radiation? It is a form of energy on the move, energy moving like light, the radio wave and x-ray and others. So the, this radiation is electromagnetic in nature. What it means is that it, it has the wave of the electric as well as the wave of the magnetic. As the bottom right, this is the illustration showing they all move through space with the speed of light. Now this is a very abstract concept, right? We can't see those waves, but we can feel the effect, isn't it? We feel the heat from the sun, the infrared. We have the radio wave, without it, we wouldn't have our internet and the television and so on. So this is a way to help us to understand that the energy been transferred through space, right? This electromagnetic wave. And also, the other term we use is a photon that carries this packets of energy. So this is the spectrum, right? just like a, a disease has a spectrum of different manifestation, different severity. So you can see the whole spectrum of it from one end, the radio wave, microwave, and to the ultraviolet, uh, and then you have the visible light and then the infrared. Right? And this is the, the, on the left hand side. On the right, you have the, the X-ray, gamma ray. And the difference is that the energy, right? Uh, so this wave, the wavelength right, of it, so the shorter is the wavelength, uh, right, the energy will be greater. So you can see that uh, illustration. So the, there is a so-called uh, demarcation. Uh, uh, those are the one on the left, you can see, it's called the non-ionizing radiation. Right? You have the visible light, the infrared, ultraviolet, uh, radio wave, microwave, and so on. The one on the right will be the ionizing, which is the X-ray, gamma ray. We are familiar with X-ray. Right? So there's these two parts of it. Now, when you talk about ionizing, what does it mean? This is a simple concept. Let's say you have an atom. Right? When this X-ray photon or the wave comes in, it knocks out the electron from the outer shell. So as a result, that the atom becomes a positive ion because there's an imbalance of electrons and protons. Right? So it's a positive because electrons lost. And this is the, the part where ionization could be considered harmful because this electron will knock out further electrons from other atoms and leading to uh, a series of events, the formation of free radicals, and so on. Now, this is the electromagnetic wave presented in different form. We are familiar with visible light, right? the rainbow color. So after the violet, and then there will be the ultraviolet. Uh, ultraviolet, ultra means beyond. Okay? So it's beyond the violet. So it divides into three parts, UV, A, B, C, and also, there's one towards the end of it, which is the vacuum UV. Uh, we seldom talk about but that is there. Uh, so, how we classify, right? This is a UV band. Okay? So, the A has certain wavelength, 400 to 320 nanometer. B is 320 to uh, 200 nanometer. And UVC, the subject of interest today, 
is 180 nanometer to 180 nanometer. Though some different uh, textbooks, different experts will classify slightly different, but nonetheless, it's about the same. So this is this part of the that's quite interesting. We talk about nanometer, right? We also often people talk about UVC 254 nanometer. How big is a nanometer? Right? We talk about nanotechnology, everything nano. So typically a coronavirus is about 100 nanometer. So we need to visualize right? it's something too small we can't see with naked eye. Uh, so let's say uh, a human hair. Uh, is about 100 micron, uh, micrometer, is about 100,000 nanometer. So if you can magnify it, right, and we arrange the coronavirus side by side, you find that you can have a thousand coronavirus particles along the width of uh, human hair. Okay? So that shows how small is the coronavirus. Also, it's quite comparable. We call it a same order of magnitude with that, the wavelength of the UVC, also for the matter, uh, other bands as well. So hope that you can appreciate this, uh, how small is this nanometer as you go along. It's quite interesting that the sun is the main source of a natural radiation, the electromagnetic wave. And we are familiar with this study in school. The a light passes through a prism. You see the rainbow color. That's just not all. It's beyond the red. You have infrared. that's feel the heat. And then beyond the violet, you have the ultraviolet. These two are invisible to our human eyes, but we can detect it, can measure it. And remember, right? The ultraviolet is invisible huh, to our human eyes. Now, some applications of the UVC just briefly run through. The, we start with the history. Actually, the, it's a long history in 1801. This German physicist, uh, Johann Wilhelm Ritter, he was doing some experiment yeah, using the prism huh, and it detected the ultraviolet using this. Uh, Photographic emulsion, a darkening, and relate to different uh, energy or wavelength. This is quite a while ago, and then subsequently, various researchers, doctors have used it for, for example, uh, this uh, Rybuck prison. You use it for the treatment of uh, skin disease uh, using ultraviolet. Uh, it, it's similar because it go beyond will be the soft X-ray, and this also been used to treat superficial uh, cancer as well. And subsequently, various uh, research and even clinical use to treat tuberculosis and various forms of uh, disease or deactivate uh, measles and bacteria and so on. So this is a brief history of the ultraviolet surface to know it's a long history, nothing new. In medical, we have used it for a long time. For example, uh, we use UVB for photo uh, therapy, right? Uh, with skin disease and the psoriasis uh, treatment has been very uh, effective and a non-invasive technique. Uh, even, for example, we do a coating, a polymer, uh, go to the dentist, and the little UV light uh, is to help in the uh, curing of that uh, polymer to protect uh, our teeth. And the various sources of the artificial UV, right? man-made. So we see a lot today, the UV lamp and then all those germicidal lamps, uh, a lot of the uh, LEDs used in the industries for the photolithography. Uh, also in the treatment of water, could be a wastewater or in the picture here shows, the, in the agriculture to deactivate or to kill the bacteria uh, in the aquaculture. And also in the industry, we see using up welding and it also besides uh, visible light and also emits ultraviolet. So there are various uh, sources of the artificial UV. It's interesting, just to note that uh, there a lot of development all being uh, motivated by how we can disinfect the coronavirus 
during the pandemic. So on the left, you see this is interesting from Patan, uh, Indonesia. So the counterpart of uh, Malaysian Nuclear Agency. And the right, you see their invention, their UVGI box uh, for sterilization. So there are many more of these uh, innovations. And that's why we need to keep up to date with this and understand how it works. And there are some potential health issues, quite interesting. Uh, on the right, you will see that uh, the restaurant entry there is they sell this UVC light, so we have to pass through this like a gantry, so called to sterilize us before we go in. But then this all have direct exposure to us. Uh, be cautious about that. And also there are some of those uh, fairly new, right? Uh, there's some special paint on the nails, and then we put under UV to dry it, so we expose our skin to this UV. And there are many such. Uh, consumer products around, uh, you see, more and more with this application. Now, how does it affect humans? How does it affect our health? And this is uh, interesting. As I mentioned, sun is the main source, or the only source of uh, natural uh, UV and the other forms of uh, electromagnetic spectrum. You have, beside UV, you have the infrared, you also have the visible light, right? All coming, we are exposed to that. And by the way, the ozone layer protects us, so the UVC has been blocked by that. However, there are holes in the ozone, right? So some UVC does get passed through, particularly those, for example, in the southern hemisphere, it's pretty big, large holes, so it passes through like those in Australia and New Zealand. So we all immerse, you can see this is a spectrum, uh, the broad one right, uh, from the sun, so called solar spectrum, we're exposed to that, right? The visible light, we see that. A little bit of UV on the, the left, and then you have the, uh, the infrared. And then we also are, beside the solar spectrum, we also receive artificial radiation exposed. A good example is radio wave, which is getting more and more with the installation of 5G and others. Uh, we are really immersed in all kinds of electromagnetic wave. Right? Uh, from the communication, uh, radio wave in particular. Right? So give you an idea that right, uh, none of us can escape not right, being exposed to radio. This is the uh, natural as well as artificial. It's interesting that WHO has set up this thing called Global UV Index. This is a form of the measure of the, the solar UV radiation level. It is important right, from the public health point of view as well. So it's on the right. This is a prediction in um, in Kuala Lumpur uh, for this week, about eight to nine. This is the index set up by the WHO. It's fairly moderate and high. So the Australia the Apansa is a very good website. They do actually measurement in various cities in Australia. You see the real time measurement and the prediction. Huh? So in January, pretty high. Huh? The extreme you see going up. Uh, that is summer. And now this was taken on the right yesterday, is slightly lower uh, during winter. So it varies with season as well and where we live. So that is of interest as well. And that's why they have this uh, advisory from WHO about wearing proper sunglasses, uh, the hats, protect ourselves from these uh, various forms of UV. Uh, this is the important part. I hope we can get it. Now, how does it work like? Uh, you go down to the cell and the nucleus, the DNA, which is a building block of life. So what does this uh, UV photon, uh, the, the packets of energy rich is? Uh, the, the DNA structure is a double helix with all these, the base pairs have uh, been formed, okay, there are four of them. So uh, interact with, with this, uh, the, the bases, right? and what happened, it break up, and it sort of bulge up. Uh, and some form uh, in scientific term we call that formation of the dimer, right? Uh, timing is one of them. Okay? So this will prevent further re replication. Okay? This is how they deactivate. So this particular DNA they can't just replicate right? itself. So this is the, the basic mechanism of it. And there are various uh, mechanisms, various uh, Theories people explain, but this is by far the, the one that has been the, the main one. There's a lot of experimental uh, evidence and study on that. Right? So, this is basically how the EV deactivate the DNA. 
Now go back to the macro level, there's different forms of, if you talk about UV, A, B, C, you need to understand, right? So the, the C is pretty penetrative, you go down to the dermis layer of the skin, this is the cross-section of the skin, and the A is just on the uh, superficial part, huh? the stratum corneum, huh? so dead layer of the, the skin. Okay? So the different penetration level uh, to the skin. And how about exposure to our eyes? Yeah? Uh, so it's mainly you see that those less than 280 nanometer is all on the surface huh? of the, the cornea of our, our eyes. Uh, so and you, uh, very interesting that again, the penetration depends on the wavelength or its uh, energy. So it is varying depth. So the two main things one to concern are the skin cancer and cataract. Right? So uh, it is well known to right, prolong exposure. One of the health effects is the formation of a melanoma, right? a form of malignant skin cancer, as well as some non-malignant uh, skin disease as well. You can see on the on the right the, the, the so-called commonly known as mole, a huh, different form of it, and then of course cataract we are something familiar with, uh, aging process, but also uh, prolonged or chronic exposure to the uh, ultraviolet or uh, different uh, wavelength of it. Okay? So this is the two main health uh, concerns that we have: huh, exposure to UV. So this is a summary of now all this we call optical radiation, be it infrared, visible, or the UV. So uh, the the skin will be erythema, the reddening of the skin uh, mainly. Okay? Uh, the, and then the, the eye is uh, photokeratitis. Right? Uh, and then the, this is for the UV part of it. And then uh, A, you also have this photochemical Let's say we are look at very brilliant light for a while, it's just uh, photo retinitis, there's some maybe pain for a while, just injury could be just temporary or sometimes maybe permanent. So this is a summary of various uh, health conditions we're exposed to optical radiation. And this is interesting, the uh, WHO fact sheet, well, cleaning, washing hand is still the effective way to disinfect. And there are a lot of gadgets, like for someone on the right showing this UV light when you put the hands in there to disinfect, right? That is no. Right? That really shows uh, warned against that. Okay? It doesn't really, okay, but it has this uh, adverse effects on, on the skin, huh? uh, erythema, and long term, there's a lot of long term effects we, we don't really know yet. Right? Now, this is the the final slide of my first part talk is considering all those biological effects and various uh, adverse health effects is to avoid direct exposure to UVC. And this is the advisory given by uh, WHO, CDC, and others. And the right, you see, this is the, the international symbol. Right? Uh, it's a triangular, this ISO symbol for uh, UV light, okay? uh, all forms of UV. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I, that was very informative, and I'm sure uh, everyone learned a lot. Uh, without much ado, I think we will now go on to uh, Dr. Naura, who will let us know uh, how we can use it and, and, and uh, safely. Uh, Dr. Naura, to you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Dr. Sashila. Uh, so I come and very good morning to everyone in this um, webinar. Uh, actually, it's a pleasure uh, to be able to join this webinar so that I can share uh, some knowledge that we have in, the, uh, in our work and also um, and uh, I, I would like to introduce some of our, uh, our work in the uh, institute. Okay, so without further ado, I, I will share uh, my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, before that, uh, yes, 
Okay, I'd like to thank um, all the key members of the breakfast at UM Health, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Faizal Ahmad and uh, Dr. Shams Ami, uh, Puan Nur Zahra for uh, uh, doing all the good job for having this kind of uh, uh, platform. Okay, um, this uh, topic is about uh, using UVC radiation effectively and safely as a disinfectant. My, my part is about uh, measurement and also the international guidelines. As uh, what Prof. Dr. Sashila has introduced me, I'm uh, the, the researcher of uh, Radiation Processing Technology Division from National Nuclear Agency. And I, perhaps uh, many of you and half of these um, uh, participants uh, in this webinar doesn't know where National Nuclear Agency is. So it's actually located in Bangi. It has been in operation since 1971. Um, we are actually a public research institute who specialize on um, nuclear and radiation related technology. So we do a lot of research there, uh, ranging from medical uh, technology, industrial, uh, radiation safety and health, agrotechnology and bioscience, and also on how uh, radiation is applied in daily life. Okay, in radiation nuclear agency, we have a many radiation facility. Um, we have the neutron radiation coming from the nuclear reactor. We have the gamma ray. We have two facilities actually for uh, using the cobalt 60, then cesium-137. We have the electron beam radiation. We have the ultraviolet uh, from UVA, UB, and UVC. From uh, Prof. Ng just now, I think uh, every one of you already know where all these radiations come from. Okay, for the UV technology at uh, our institute, we have um, been using UVA and UVB for resin curing, mostly. And we also do some uh, UVC lamp profiling. And we are currently doing the development of UVC, UVGI prototype for general inspection. And actually, we have an, another group that we call um, non-ionizing radiation, uh, who in charge of the safety for um, this kind of uh, UV for this uh, radiation. So come back uh, with, the, with the UV, UVC, UVC technology. See, ever since the pandemic hit us, uh, it has uh, uh, had a dramatic impact on the demand for the existing UVC products. Okay, new UVC products have also been introduced to capitalize uh, on the demand for disinfection technologies. So as you can see here uh, in this uh, picture, you can see that uh, there are many public spaces have been using ultraviolet system, uh, such as the New York City subway, to get the, to deactivate the virus, and uh, some of them are planning to apply it in the schools. And this is the public bus disinfection in Shanghai, China, where they put uh, many UVC lamps in the chamber, and the bus uh, pass in into the tunnel. Okay, now back to the, the UVC radiation. Since um, UVC is between uh, 200 to 280 uh, wavelengths, so it, it is very um, uh, uh, penetrative to the cell wall of the uh, DNA and uh, RNA of a molecule. So it can absorb and destroy the RNA and DNA which are prohibiting the reproduction of the microorganism. So based uh, back to the um, Prof. Uh, Ng uh, presentation, this UVC is actually um, not, not naturally comes to um, uh, the earth. So we have to artificially made it. In terms of safety aspect of UVC, uh, it is considered as dangerous rays. And uh, why? Because it is located just next to the X-ray. Huh? Why? Because X-ray is the ionizing radiation, while ultraviolet is still considered as non-ionizing. But from there, we need to, that's why we need to um, importantly identify the region where the wavelength is and keep it below the threshold limit value. Okay, back, back to the UVC source. We can see that there are lots of uh, variety of sizes and shapes uh, where in the markets are there are lots of low pressure mercury vapor lamps um, that produce 
purely 254 nanometer UVC. And this UVC has uh, about 20 to 30% output out of the, the, the total input that you uh, normally buy. Okay, this, life, this uh, lamp is, uh, has a lifetime depreciation, uh, typically 15 to 20% over 19,000 hours of life. And it loses some about 50% uh, in 6,000 hour life with moderate switching rate. So the more you switch on, switch uh, the, the lamp, it will reduce the lamp further. Okay, this is a man made EVC. So it just it looks uh, similar to normal lamp in your room. You can see it's a fluorescent lamp uh, on the left side. It has a uh, uh, glass tube. Okay, then this glass tube will prevent the UV radiation uh, from coming out from the tube. While the right side is the UVC, UVC lamp. It has similar construction, uh, but because of the quartz tube uh, that, uh, hold the, that hold the inode and cathode, it will, it will reveal, re, uh, release uh, about 95% of UVC light to um, uh, uh, outside of the uh, lab, okay? And this is the uh, most simple version I can show, but the type of UVC lamp where it can be divided to three, mostly. Uh, the first one is a Simon lamp. Second is the mercury lamp. And the third one is LED. The one with um, the most in the market is the mercury lamp, where um, the cheapest one is low pressure, uh, and it has been uh, improved into low pressure, high output, and it is also in a medium pressure um, standard. All these lamps are known as um, and can produce ozone, uh, but uh, some of it can be uh, reduced. Some of the ozone has been filtered out and only produce low low uh, ozone. For the assignment lamp, it is very special because uh, it is. Um, uh, Constructed, uh, constructed with uh, the krypton, krypton chlorine uh, material, so it will produce only two to two nanometer wavelength. Okay, so how to identify this lamp? Okay, in Inclimation, we have this uh, light spectrometer. So using this light spectrometer, we can um, characterize every lamp so that we know where the region should be. So here we can see that some of the lamp has one single um, peak like this. Some has um, uh, multiple peaks. Okay. So how we know? Okay, we see, we see this, this is the emission spectrum of UV lamp. UV lamp. So the left side, uh, the green color um, peak here, is the UVC because it is located within two hundred to two hundred eighty region. The red color is um, UVB. Uh, the blue color is UVA. So whenever we check the UVC, UV lamp, so we need to ensure that the peak is appear within the um, UVC region. Okay. About the uh, type of lamp, low pressure lamp and medium pressure lamp is very different. Uh, low pressure lamp has one single peak. Uh, very um, uh, distinguished uh, single peak, while the medium pressure has a very a lot uh, has a lot of noise around here. So when we put in together with the germicide effectiveness uh, curve, we can see that the low pressure UV lamp is um, much closer to the peak of germicide effectiveness. What is the germicide effectiveness? I'll show you later. Okay, after this. Okay, here is the germicide efficiency. This is actually uh, based on the historical bac uh, bacterial bactericidal action spectrum that was constructed by um, F. L. Gates in 1930, uh, uh, based on bacterium E. coli. So um, this curve has been used by manufacturers, UVC lamp manufacturers all over the world, uh, to to um, manufacture the most closest um, lamp uh, with length that can meet the highest peak of this curve. Okay, so that's why um, 
in a new technology right now, we have an LED technology who uh, can can um, uh, emit spectrum which is uh, next to similar to 260 or, or 265. Okay, about the determination of EVC intensity, this is also important in uh, measurement because here we need to uh, identify how is the strength of the lamp. Okay, um, it, is, uh, it follows the inverse square law of lights where uh, the intensity of lights will reduce uh, with the distance, okay. The reduction is about uh, one fourth of the uh, norm, the uh, initial light. Okay, this is example that we um, uh, did with the, with the UVC tower. So the first meter, first one meter, uh, the intensity is about one hundred seventy, and after. At two meter, it reduced one fourth of the initial um, initial uh, intensity, and the third meter, uh, it has reduced further. So you can uh, uh, predict how far the lamp, the intensity of lamp, will cover in a room. Okay, about the safety, as you all know, that UVB and UVC can cause skin and irritation. Uh, there's a threshold limit for all this where um, CDC, NIOSH, and ACGIH has limit about 6 millijoule for the daily 8-hour uh, shift. And these uh, devices, all these uh, UVC devices need to incorporate safeties in their peak system and need trained maintenance staff to maintain all the equipment. Okay, here is the example of uh, the threshold limit can be referred to the um, ACGIH uh, guideline. Okay, now we have another one, um, another new technology that was called as a far UVC. I know that everyone um, is being uh, thrilled with this uh, technology. Yes, it is uh, uh, produced with length at two to two and nanometer, which we all know that it is a relatively safe to the skin. Uh, there are two technologies that can produce this uh, kind of light. Uh, one is the SIMA lamp, the Krypton chlorine uh, lamp. And then another one is the LED technology. So LED technology is far uh, expensive, far more expensive than the SIMA lamp. Uh, and about the threshold limit, this kind of um, uh, uh, UVC light can be um, can be exposed at least more more than uh, uh, than the two five four nanometer UVC in an eight hour shift. Okay, so you can see uh, in the graph here how these uh, two lamps, yeah, 222 and 254, in comparison um, to the skin, the, the, trend, the penetration to the skin, where 254 can penetrate further uh, into the epidermis, while 222 is just slightly above the epidermis. Okay, why for UVC is a concern? Although it is safe, it is considered safe to the skin. It has a very worrisome second harmonic peak. Okay, because all the UV lights is not coming with one single wavelength. Some of it comes with um, one dominant peak, but it has some some other um, uh, wavelength as a byproduct. So, as you can see in this uh, figure, the Red color is without filter uh, for UVC. The blue color is with filter. So whenever you try to have this kind of uh, lamp, make sure that it is uh, filtered. It's, it is well filtered. And uh, for 222 nanometer UVC lamp, the UVC dose is completely different from 254 nanometer. So whenever uh, we want to disinfect uh, microorganism, we need to have another set of database uh, different from 254. Okay, okay. how to calculate, uh, how to get the effective dose? We need to have the target, targeted microorganism. We need to uh, very certain what, what kind of microorganism that we want to disinfect. Uh, for how many log reduction we want, whether it's 90%, 99.9%, .9%, it's up to us. And then uh, 
we need to understand whether our target is stationary or moving. Stationary means uh, on the surface, we, need, we, we, we can measure the UVC dose. If a moving target like um, air or water, we need to have the good uh, in intensity range. Okay, uh, we need to understand the lamp spec and also the space and area for dispersion. So what is dose? It is um, actually this, uh, dose is actually the sum of how much light a surface has uh, to receive. Let's say um, like you boil water, you need to have um, a good fire and you need to let it uh, heat for a certain time. So this is, it is the same, the same concept to um, UVC. So you need a good uh, intensity of lamp and you need to have a certain time to, to get it exposed. And why all these matters and this dose is um, matters because if you give too low of dose, it will be under, under exposure. This under exposure will let the germs to still be able to spread because it is it is not completely die. And if you use uh, over exposure radiation, you will waste resources and also affect the productivity. Okay, this is how it it is used in the formulation. And uh, compared to uh, uh, viruses, fungus spore is much more least susceptible to UV light. So some of the um, uh, application, they target to, uh, to kill the fungus spores or bacteria spores so that viruses are also killed. Okay, this is the uh, in a study. So uh, where they, they study uh, using the uh, number of uh, UVC dose. Okay, actually there are lots of um, international guidelines can uh, can be referred to. Uh, the most uh, important one here is the SCNRP because it is an international commission on uh, non-ionizing radiation protection. Uh, it, uh, and then you can also uh, check with the IUVA. IUVA is International Ultraviolet Association on the what dose that you need to kill the bacteria or viruses. And for if you plan to install this UVC in a building, you can also refer to ASHRAE. ASHRAE is an American society for the uh, health uh, and radiation. And we can also refer to NIOSH uh, International, ACIGIH for the TLV limit, and also the ISO if you need to measure the UVC. Okay, this is an example of um, the database from the IUVA, where it lists all the viruses, bacteria, and uh, how many uh, dose you need for this. Uh, killing. Okay, the latest uh, uh, study for the SARS-CoV uh, using UVC shows that about 100 millijoule can kill the um, SARS-CoV, uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, uh, virus. Okay, in a short position uh, recently uh, published in 2020, it says that uh, UVGI can be used um, to, to reduce the risk from infection or resource. So we can still follow the, the guidelines uh, published by CDC in 2005 and 2009. Uh, in NIOSH Malaysia, it's very limited. And actually in uh, Malaysia, there's a health technology assessment unit uh, who conduct this uh, technology review on UVGI. But it's so long uh, because it has been done in 2006, so it must be update, updated, never been updated until now. So this is safety just now. Okay, what, is, what makes this UVC technology a choice? Uh, it's normally because it of, uh, it's a dry process. Uh, it is a quick, very fast uh, cycle. We don't, no need chemi uh, chemical in the process. And there will be no chemical residue as well that uh, will later uh, produce a superbug like we, what we do if we use uh, chemicals. Uh, it is easy to handle and some systems can be left running for 24-7. Uh, compared to um, using chemical disinfectant, it's uh, relatively economical. But the cons, eh, cons of this UVC light because 
it is highly hazardous to eyes and skin. It requires a right condition to be effective. Some system needs a professional for installation and need maintenance um, at least once a year. Okay, loss of um, UV system in the market for surface air, surface air, um, we can see here. Okay, this is the, the example of surface and air treatment where you put in the room, you will disinfect surface, we will disinfect uh, air in the process. Uh, some of it are uh, fixed to the shilling of the operation theater so that uh, it will be uh, used once the um, operation finish. And uh, maybe in the modern technology, they will use it in, in um, car. Okay, this is the upper air, and normally put in um, room fixed to the wall, and it, it is um, for air treatment above occupied zone, above unoccupied zone. Eh? Okay, this is the upper air um, configuration where you put here, then the radiation is on top of our head, does it? Uh, it will not um, shine uh, right at the at the occupant area. Okay, the lots more here is self-contained treatment where the radi the radiation UV radiation is um, doing this infection in the um, closed container. Uh, the right side is the one that they fix in the HVAC system, so that the air come. Uh, the bad air coming in can be purified and uh, released. So there's a lot of um, uh, guidelines you can check. And here's uh, some of it uh, is using UVC as a uh, disinfectant in uh, cabinet okay, to, to disinfect small tools. And it is very effective because it is self-contained. So you don't you don't uh, get exposed to the uh, UV, okay? And you have to um, be um, aware that there are lots of um, claim out there. So you need to be uh, 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 careful, okay? Um, that's why to 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 um, avoid all this claim, we need an industrial standards to. Um, take care of this. Okay, I think uh, this all is a conclusion. I hope I can show uh, two two minutes uh, video. Uh, Prof, uh, can I can I have the, that kind of video? Uh, Go ahead. All right. Okay, it was very quick uh, video. I hope since the onset can... of the COVID nineteen pandemic, UVC light or electromagnetic energy in the germicidal UVC wavelength has become a key technology in mitigating the spread of the deadly virus. The technology's popularity dates back nearly a century when scientists discovered that the sun's UV energy destroys germs and bacteria. In less than a second, UVC light can inactivate pathogens, essentially neutralizing infectious diseases. To illustrate how easily infectious pathogens can spread, we used a computer simulation to model a student sneezing in the middle of a classroom. The simulation shows what scientists already know. Aerosols expelled during coughing, sneezing, or even talking can travel with room air more than 30 to 40 feet. This same process occurs repeatedly in commercial offices, restaurants, grocery stores, TSA checkpoints, and doctor waiting rooms. To determine the effectiveness of UVC upper room fixtures, we conducted a side-by-side -side comparison of two classrooms, one fitted with germicidal UVC fixtures and the other without. These wall-mounted fixtures shine ultraviolet light across the top portion of a room, safely above people's heads. During this simulation, notice how quickly infectious aerosols are inactivated in the bottom classroom, which is fitted with upper room UVC fixtures. The germicidal energy renders harmless the majority of the airborne pathogens. The infection mitigation impact of the germicidal fixtures becomes clear. In spaces without UVC, such as the top classroom, contagious droplets can linger for several minutes, and the longer someone is exposed to viral particles, the more likely they are to become infected and allow further spread of the disease. Here's how it works. Upper room fixtures use the natural rise and fall of convection and mechanical air currents to lift pathogens overhead and into the UVC zone. 
The 253.7 nanometer UVC wavelength attacks a germ's DNA, or RNA, rendering it harmless and unable to reproduce. And since the UV energy is overhead, occupants are safe to go about their normal business. In fact, this natural disinfectant works so well that the CDC and ASHRAE recommend UVC to slow the spread of the deadly COVID-19 disease. By eliminating airborne allergens, bacteria, and viruses, upper room UVC fixtures stop pathogens cold. They're perfect in emergency rooms, nursing homes, doctor's offices, classrooms, or anywhere groups of people congregate. To recap, UVC inactivates infectious microbes, leaving them unable to reproduce. Upper room UV fixtures installed near a room ceiling neutralize microbes as they circulate. Upper room UVC fixtures have a long scientifically proven history of inactivating airborne pathogens, with concentrations further reduced with each subsequent pass of recirculated air through the upper room. Mother Nature's own germ remover, UVC, helps halt the spread of airborne diseases so people are safer and healthier. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you. Since hey. the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura. That was very informative. And I think a lot of uh, the questions asked in the question and answer box has been answered in, in some of your presentations, which we will tackle later more in detail. Uh, now, we will, uh, we will go back to uh, Prof Ng, who will just give us a, a brief summary on the systematic review of, uh, of uh, UVC currently. Uh, Prof Ng, back to you. Yeah, uh, I will wrap up with uh, the most recent systematic review. This is where scientists and doctors review whatever is published uh, in journals. And the uh, probably the one, the more uh, reliable one is just published a couple of months ago. Uh, yeah, the, it's called the efficacies of ultraviolet light emitting technology against coronaviruses, a systematic review. Uh, the lead author is Chapla, uh, published in the Journal of Hospital Infection. Uh, so nine, uh, 18 qualified papers were selected, included, they have been, uh, the criteria for that is published between 72 to 2020. Uh, so you can see they back quite a while ago. And all these experimental studies uh, on various uh, pathogens, including six papers on SARS-CoV-2, then you also had MERS and also the seasonal coronaviruses. These are common uh, seasonal colds, also animal coronaviruses. It's quite interesting. Now, there are some drawbacks on, on this systematic review that uh, they did not report a couple of things. For example, the UV technology they used, like 2 out of 19, uh, 18, they didn't say that. And also, uh, 5 out of 18 of them didn't report on the UV spectrum, which means what is the wavelength and uh, the uh, spectrum of the wavelength. And uh, no, that is serious. 13 out of 18 didn't report on the power. Huh? The power is important. You realize the UV dose. So it's difficult to make a proper comparison. And all these studies are experimental studies, they are laboratory studies. So they are really not conducted in the actual clinical environment. So we must uh, take this into consideration uh, when we look at the, the papers they publish, whatever claims they do. Obviously, more studies will be needed. Now, this is their conclusion that despite the white heterogeneity, I mean diversity, uh, with in the included studies, complete inactivation of coronaviruses on surfaces or aerosolized was reported to take the maximum exposure time of 15 minutes and to need a maximum distance from the UV emitter of up to a, a meter. Okay, so this is the conclusion based on this review or however papers published uh, on that. And mostly these studies, they have UVC, a couple of them, UVA, uh, now, we like to offer some recommendations to the members of the public, to the industry, to the healthcare workers, and, this is, and also the government agencies as well. The UV technology is 
developing very rapidly. You hear a lot, you read a lot. So we need more research on its efficacy and also the safety. And then we must also create awareness and uh, educate all stakeholders. That is very important to keep up to date with that, to understand the basic uh, of that. And we need to understand and put the safety first, very important, safety first, our health, our uh, children's health and everyone's health. And also there's a need to have a national guidelines and also standards. And that's so important so that uh, we'll be using this technology uh, effectively and safely. And as mentioned earlier, uh, this timely, we should update our health technology assessment. It was done in, uh, I think, 2016, right? So lots of things have changed. So that should be very good uh, if the Ministry of Health were to initiate an update of the health technology assessment. And uh, finally, what are these kids doing? It's, just, and it's quite interesting. Now, this is from National Geographic. You wonder what are they doing lining up wearing my sunglasses. And this is uh, somewhere in the uh, Russia, right? And long winter, no exposure. You need sunlight. And they have this yeah, UV lamp, right? It's B uh, and A, a mixed spectrum uh, for the healthy growth, right? So we know that uh, it's important. It is the source of the vitamin D, right? Uh, UVB is necessary. You can see this uh, diagram just illustrate the importance of the, the sunlight, the UV, uh, to stimulate the vitamin D, which is health, uh, important for the bone health. Okay. With that, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ng. So uh, we are almost to nine o'clock, but then I've gotten the green light to proceed for another 15 minutes because a lot of questions here and, and a lot of participants have stayed on to listen to more uh, because this, as you said, is a very hot topic. So I'm going to, just going to pick some salient ones. If you all go to the Q&A, there's some questions maybe you all can just answer uh, separately in the box if you can. So I'll go to the first question. Someone has asked... Um, how can a commercial UVC device be determined to do what it says it does? Uh, you know, meaning I, I, I think there are a lot of commercial products out there. People come and tell us this is good, that is good. How do we know that it's actually effective? Is there a way to measure that it's effective as well as if it's safe? Uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe Nara, you can help us with that. Okay. Um about the device, UVC device that you have uh, in the market. Normally, um, nobody so sure whether it is uh, it, it has uh, what has been uh, advertised in the spec. So all you need to do is um, always stick to the uh, reputable brand, uh, such as uh, Philips, Osram, uh, or Atlanta Lights, or anything that uh, has a good track record in manufacturing the lamp. And if you are not um, so sure, you can also refer to uh, our institute so that we can uh, have a check for you. Thank you very much, Nara. I think, I think one of the experiences that we had, you know, manufacturers might be using the Philips lamp, but you know, actually are they calculating the dose correctly? putting the, uh, you know, how many lamps they're supposed to be putting, uh, what is the intensity. I think that is also an issue, right? So I think uh, it's, it's a very good idea if, if you know, you're, if, if uh, you are, you're buying something and you're unsure of it, maybe you could get in touch with Nuclear Agency Malaysia and ask for their help, uh, you know, especially if you're, you're putting many of these devices. Uh, I've got another question here, uh, maybe to Prof Ng. Is UVC clinically proven to be effective against RNA-based viruses? Uh, and um, uh, has it been used, uh, clinically proven to disinfect operation theaters? Can you repeat the question louder? Uh, is UVC proven to be effective against RNA viruses? RNA virus. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's quite similar structure to the... RNA, DNA, in terms of its uh, dimension and the structure, so it, it should be. Yeah, I think there are some papers uh, published on that as well. Then the second question? Uh, the other question is, is it effective, to be shown to be effective in OTs, 
Um, and someone said, is it uh, effective against fungi, molds, and zygomitis? Oh, the second part, uh, actually, it's an advantage of using the UVC. Actually, a lot of people have it before the pandemic started, right? This, the home use is effective, right? You have the activate bacteria or various form of fungi. Huh? Those of us have allergy to that. Huh? It is effective. And we need to be cautious using this effectiveness. Yeah? It really depends on the usage, huh? how effective. Just like a medicine, right? how effective it is. If you don't take three times a day, take once, it's not effective. So similarly, we'll be cautious uh, as to usage, how long is exposure, the distance, the environment, is it ventilation, the humidity, all this come into picture. So we, we shouldn't take it uh, we take a face value only like those who claim ninety nine point nine 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 percent. We take it with a pinch of salt, right? Uh, so that you be cautious about that. Right? Thank you. Um, just uh, maybe Naura can answer this. How far behind are we from this international circle with use of UVC in the country? Do you think we should be using more in the country? Um. Uh, of course, uh, I would like to encourage more application of, of this uh, radiation, UVC radiation. But the first thing I, I think we need to have a good knowledge in this uh, technology because I don't want people to use this um, technology without knowing the hazard and the risk that they are going to have. So uh, I think education is more important first. Uh, and then later, once you know what to um how to select good lamb, how to get a good dose for what you want, then only you know how, uh, what is the best uh, UVC device for you. Yeah. May I add uh, to that? To your prof. Oh. Go ahead, prof, please. Okay, add. now, the, in, including the technology is developing rapidly, but it's important to use it safely. I've seen a lot of advertisement where they put a UVC lamp in the bedroom. They advertise when you sleep next to that is UVC lamp. Definitely that, you know, they have not uh, advisable to do that. Huh? It's really harmful to us because for UVC, you should avoid direct exposure to that. Huh? It's very clear. Uh, the evidence is there. So the stakeholders, like members of public, huh, all should be educated and be aware of this fact. Thank you, Prof. Uh, now, now, I think this is a question for you, which I have asked and uh, I'm, I'm much clearer now. The question is, does far uh, UVC, which is 222 nanometers, produce ozone? That is the first one. And this, the second one is, how does, does ozone help with this infection? Okay. Um... Uh, I think I have answered uh, that question in the Korean A, but it's okay, okay. I, I will repeat okay. it. Uh, uh, 5VC or any UVC lamp, it will come with the size wavelength. So all you need to um, uh, do is to make sure that um, this 5VC only comes in between, the peak it must be in between 207 to 230. Uh, 207 to 230 nanometer only so that it is very um, uh, limited penetration to the skin. If there is a wavelength beyond that, then it will cause a danger to your skin. And if it comes at 185 nanometer, it will produce ozone. So all wavelength at 180 to, to 185, uh, it will come with the ozone. And this ozone is actually... Uh, in some industries, they use this for disinfection uh, because uh, ozone can also um, be becomes a radicals that that kill uh, the the viruses. But some of the need in healthcare setting, I don't I don't see uh, the need. Maybe in other application, they will use this as a disinfection disinfection uh, method. Thank you very much, uh, Nara. I think I think uh, one of the questions I think because there's so many so many types of UVC uh, in the market maybe I'll just summarize uh, and you can you can add on to it so for all those who are asking actually uh, if we look at CDC and, and and most of the guidelines now UVC technology can be used for disinfection of surface surface or surface and air 
For surface disinfection, this is what the towel UVC is. For that one, people cannot be in the room. It is used as terminal cleaning. That means after the patient has been discharged or end of the day, everyone has gone home, we put in the clean the room, your Clorox, a normal disinfectant, and then you put the UVC as a final cleaning and no one should be in the room. There's a second one that is known as upper room UVGI. This is where the UVGI gadget is put on the top of your wall that's above your head. And that one actually uh, cleans the air that, that comes to the top. For that sort of uh, UVGI disinfection, you need to have good air mixing in the room. Okay. And the third type of UVGI is intraductal, meaning the UVG light is put in the ducts inside your, your ceiling and it cleans the air as it goes to the duct or it cleans the air in the air handling unit itself. That one is safe because it is you know beyond direct contact of human skin. So at the moment, these are the three ones that have Not shown exactly. to be uh, actually um, some benefit, but these are all used as adjunct therapy. The most important thing is your ventilation, isn't it? Improving your your um, mechanical ventilation, your natural ventilation of hybrid. And these technologies are used as adjunct therapy to improve further. So your basic one, like cleaning with your Clorox or your soap and water, hand hygiene, masking, is all uh, paramount. Uh, the, uh, Prof. Ng, Naura, do you want to add on, on that? Uh, no, for me. No, no. I agree with you. Yeah, so the other thing I want to say is, you know, in a lot of these clinics, I think one of the questions is, you know, you have this box and then you have a UVC inside there with some filter and that one, you, you just put it like an air purifier on the table. Is that safe? Sorry, again. Uh, uh, so, you know, sometimes you have this now a gadget, uh, which is just like a standalone Mm -hmm. Everything has got UVC inside and you can just put it on your table or on the floor. Is that safe for someone to be in the room at that time when this sort of gadget is going on? Is it effective? Uh, was it because, uh, 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 is it the same like UVC tower? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, so I think that's, that's the thing. I think uh, people have to really understand that if uh, the UVC is put into a gadget, and you put on, on in your room, it is not actually, uh, the UVC is not coming out and cleaning the air. It's actually cleaning the air that's being sucked into the gadget, clean and push back out again. So oh, okay. But the yeah. now you just go. Do you mean the, the self-contained uh, gadgets? Okay, yeah. the self-contained gadgets is very safe because uh, the process is inside the chamber. So no exposure, uh, radiation exposure. Uh, the only things coming and out, coming in the chamber and out is the air only. So you are safe, totally safe there. Yeah. But for that, you really need to measure the air exchange that is going in and yes. getting in and come out mm -hmm. and you know how big your room is. So it's it's what functions like a portable HEPA, yeah. uh, portable air cleaner. Mm -hmm. uh, usually you have a HEPA inside. This one you have a UVGI inside. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think these are uh, uh, some of the questions. The other one is for this equipment that, you know, this UVGI equipment that we use in, in, uh, um, in companies or in the hospital, do you need some sort of uh, certification like MDA or CIRIM or uh, any sort of certification? Uh, this is the issue because uh, uh, this uh, UVC technology is not under... Uh, uh, serum or NIOSH or what because uh, we have a non-ionizing radiation group uh, in Malaysia which is under MOH and also under Malaysian Nuclear Agency so the responsibility is what uh, as what I have been informed is under MOH actually uh, and when it comes to public uh, usage uh, I think uh, government agencies uh, both of government agencies has, has to work together uh, in uh, looking after this uh, kind of technology, new new UVC technology. Can I add to that? Now, if it's ionizing radiation like X-ray, gamma ray, right? It's under Act 304, right? which has been enforced right? uh, very strictly. But UV is classified as non-ionizing radiation. 
though you know also the UVC has also near the border with the ionizing radiation and thus it's not under the Act 304. Okay? Having said that, the, the Ministry of Health right, is, and then the other agencies uh, we encourage to set up some guidance notes, huh, safety notes, so really provide safety for all. Now, if we introduce the, uh, this upper room UVGI and others in the hospital environment, then uh, we're under the preview of the medical devices uh, agency authority, uh, MDA, uh, as a medical device. So uh, that also another aspect. So we have still a long way to go in terms of national guidelines and standards, and that is uh, very important. And I believe that the public awareness education will initiate this uh, so that all stakeholders will collaborate and to make sure that we use this technology effectively and safely for all the people. I totally agree. And I think uh, a lot of questions is there uh, around that as well. How we know it's effective, what is the dose, how we're not we're being cheated, it's how we do it's fake. And, and I think that's that's what we're all grappling with. There's no standards and, and some scruples people oh. can take advantage of it. Uh, uh, Dr. Naura and, and Prof. Ng, if you all don't mind, can you all answer some of the questions in there? I think that some of them are reputation. Some of them are personal questions who are asking for your email address. Uh, uh, so please uh, give, uh, please send it to them. And uh, uh, I think with that, we are coming to an end. But just before we end, I just want to say that COVID-19 is here to stay. All right. Uh, There's not going to be a one day that maybe many, many years, uh, you know, I do not know how long, but it's going to be another virus that we will eventually learn to live with, like influenza and TB and the rest of them, our bacterial like TB. Eventually, it will become another respiratory pathogen that's endemic uh, once the population becomes more immune it, it, you know, and stable. However, to reduce the risk of getting infected, uh, it is important that we minimize our exposure to the virus by doing good hand hygiene, masking up, keeping our distance, especially if you're not feeling well or you've come in contact with someone who's unwell, keeping the environment clean and improving ventilation to reduce the concentration of the virus. So concentration is very important that you're exposed to. UVGI may be used as a supplement environment disinfectant to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 and other pathogens. So it's not only for SARS-CoV-2, also other bacterial pathogens uh, and other viruses as well. When, uh, when options for increasing room ventilation and filtration have been optimized, that means you've done everything else that you can in your room and uh, that's all. And, and you can't optimize further, then these things can be used as, as adjunctum. So application of uh, UVC, UVGI, so that's ultraviolet germicidal irradiation in disinfectant, in healthcare facilities include, as I mentioned earlier, service disinfection after routine terminal cleaning, upper room UVGI to provide air cleaning within occupied spaces, and induct UVGI systems which are installed within the central ventilation system to help enhance air cleaning inside a central ventilation system. So, uh, but finally, to end this pandemic, the most important thing for us to do is to get vaccinated. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank all the participants uh, for, for joining us today to listen to this very important uh, presentation that we even until today I'm grappling with. And uh, I want to thank the, our panel, Prof Ng and Dr. Nara, who have been just so great in, in helping us out in, in uh, uh, you know, the infection control department in UMMC uh, to advise us on, on what we should be using and, and educating us and, and uh, so willing to come and, and give us this talk this morning. Uh, it's an excellent talk, actually. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Nara and, and Prof. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thanks.